John chapter 12, and we'll be studying there tonight about Jesus and about Mary and Martha, Lazarus, and some of the things that occurred during a supper that was held in Bethany in Jesus' honor. John chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, came, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put in it. And then Jesus said, let her alone Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Most people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they, that they might see Lazarus also, whom he'd raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that reason... Of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. As we have observed before, the ministry of Jesus, his public ministry, is coming to an end. Uh, at the end of chapter 12, John will give a summary there, beginning about uh, verse 44, quoting from Jesus about the ministry of Christ, and then chapter 13 will mark the beginning of the end, if you will, with Jesus uh, washing the disciples' feet. John is chronological more so than the others, and so there is a little problem with some chronology here at the beginning of the chapter, and then there are a great many things that John just jumps over uh, here at the end of these few days to go directly to the passion of Christ. But notice there it says that six days before Passover, Jesus came. And there's some question as to what day of the week this may have been. I'm inclined to think that Jesus arrived in Bethany on Friday afternoon. And that evening, as uh, the sun was setting and the day was ending, the disciples sat at this table with Jesus and Lazarus and Simon, who was their host, according to the parallels in Matthew and Mark. And they engaged in this meal where Mary came and anointed the feet of Jesus. This account is put in a little bit different place in Matthew and Mark, but all three of them agree in one thing, and that is that it was before the Passover and that it is primarily mentioned in order to set the stage for Judas betraying Christ. And I'll have some more to say about that in a moment. I believe that he, the six days tells us when the feast occurred, and that primarily because of uh, verse 12, where the statement is made by John that on the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palms and so forth, thus talking about the regnal entry of Jesus, or what some folks call the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. But we know that occurred early in the week. It was the first thing that is recorded about Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And so for to have him coming in on the Sabbath day uh, doesn't fit, and to have him immediately then coming on the day after uh, the day of the Sabbath doesn't fit. And so we've, we've got to try and get these in here. And so I, I just think that John is saying six days before, which puts us on Friday, and Jesus resting because the 
the actual eating of the meal would have been right there at the end or the beginning of the Sabbath. And so that would be one day and then so on and so forth, counting forward. But there are several scenarios that are used, and, and we may or may not ever be able to resolve them. But again, it's not the, literary, it's not the, the days and how they're actually counted that's important. It is the purpose for which this feast is mentioned in all three of the accounts. And that is to get us to focus on what um, Judas was doing. So it says there that they made him a supper. And the question comes, well, who made the supper? According to the list here, uh, Martha seems to have been the hostess because it says that she was serving there in verse 2. But according to Matthew 26 and verse 6 and Mark chapter 14 and verse 3, the feast or supper is held in the house of Simon, who is called the leper. And that it's just like Simon the sorcerer. We sometimes refer to Simon the sorcerer. But actually he was not a sorcerer. He had been a sorcerer. He who had previously practiced sorcery. And so that's the idea here. Simon is a leper. He had been a leper, but Jesus healed him. And it's interesting that in Mark and Matthew's account, uh, the disciples are not mentioned by name. Judas is not called out as having said these words, but uh, John makes sure that we know it was Judas who voiced the, the sentiment that this ointment should have been sold and the money given to the poor. And he is specifically referred to by John as Simon's son. And so it seems that Judas Iscariot was the son of Simon the leper, who was this disciple who um, was host of Jesus here in Bethany. So now we kind of get a sense of some things that we uh, may have not realized before and how Judas came into this inner circle of, of Jesus' disciples. But he had been a part of this close group of disciples whom Jesus had spent so much time with. Here Simon is his host, Martha is the hostess, and so that indicates a very close relationship. Maybe Simon's wife was dead, we don't know for sure, and that she's over there waiting, serving in, his, in, in that capacity. But to have this relationship obviously shows these folks were friends, they knew one another well, and this explains how Jesus came to be associated with Judas Iscariot. Jesus is the guest of honor, and Lazarus is there. We've already mentioned Judas is there. And then some of the other disciples are there. We know this from Matthew 26 in particular because there Matthew says that it wasn't just Judas alone. He doesn't even mention Judas, but he says that some of the disciples said. And so while we want to properly, because John does this, so we know Judas was leading in this sentiment, but Judas was not the only one who had this sentiment. And then the central character, perhaps, as far as the things that are taking place, is Mary. And once again, we see that Mary is not serving. We were introduced to her in Luke chapter 10, you know, and Martha complains, says, Mary has left serving. And so here again, Mary has left serving, and Martha is doing the serving, but this time she's not complaining. And so we have Mary and Martha, but Mary is doing something else that's very important here. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. Someone might say, well, why have this supper? and Why all this to do? Well, again, it's the Passover season. And so that's a festive time among the Jews. And it was very common that as disciples were coming to Jerusalem, and this is expressed here in verse uh, 1 and 2, that it was that time, and so as people are coming to Jerusalem, uh, they uh, are oftentimes came early and purified themselves to participate in the feast, and they spent that extra time with their relatives, just like we do in the holidays here. It's, you know, I, I try always to mark off the last two weeks of the year for me and, you know, and take that time, and maybe we'll go and spend some time with family or something. So it's not uncommon to do that. And this is what the Jews were doing, and this is why this feast or meal was held. It was a common thing to do, um, and, and, and you see that from many passages. 
um, that the Jews did this, had these meals together. But when we think about it, and think about what has just happened back in John chapter 11, and Lazarus has been raised from the dead, and we know that Jesus has clearly been indicating that he will soon die, it is not unlikely that the disciples used this as an occasion to just be with Jesus. And certainly I think Mary and Martha understood this, as did Lazarus, that their time with Jesus was short. And so they wanted to be with Jesus and have some time with Jesus. You remember the Lord had given a parable early on. Uh, it's recorded in Mark 2 and Luke 5 as well, that uh, the parable of the bride chamber, the bridegroom and the bride chamber. And says that as the disciples of John came and said, why is it that your disciples don't fast, but the Pharisees and John's disciples do fast? And Jesus gave this parable. He said, well, do the, do, do, do the friends of the bridegroom fast when they're celebrating the marriage of the groom? Well, I know they're feasting and having a good time with one another and enjoying one another. And then Jesus goes on to say, the time will come when the bridegroom is no longer with them that they will fast. They will long for one of the days of the Son of Man. And so it is evident that Jesus knew he would leave his disciples, and I believe his disciples are beginning to understand this. But you know, for nothing else, it's just simply a good opportunity to hear Jesus teach. Uh, these folks have been with Jesus enough to know that if we have Jesus in our home, we're going to hear something worthwhile. And that's the way it was any time Jesus accepted someone's hospitality. Remember there in Luke chapter 7 was Simon the Pharisee, another Simon, but Simon the Pharisee. And it's also in that chapter we have another woman who washed Jesus' feet. But nevertheless, Simon the Pharisee, Jesus said to him, Simon, I have somewhat to say to thee. And Simon said, say on, Lord. And he wanted Jesus to teach. And so Jesus gave a couple of parables on that occasion, one dealing with that woman who had washed his feet. And so we see that it's just a good reason to have Jesus is to have an opportunity to teach. And we ought to realize that, that hospitality in our home is an opportunity, an occasion for teaching. It's an occasion for encouraging one another. It's an occasion that we can use what we know about Jesus and what we know about Christianity to share and to teach and to hopefully lead others to Christ. Now imagine, if you can, a, a large area in, in the courtyard. Most of the uh, Jewish houses were, had flat roofs, and so it's possible they were up on the roof, but it doesn't say that they are. It doesn't give any indication of that. But they're probably out in the courtyard uh, of the house, a large open area. That would have been exposed outdoors. It may have had some sort of covering over it. But here's Jesus sitting at the head of a long table, not a table like you think of in your dining room, but a, a, a low table, uh, and, and they are reclining at table. And this is exactly the word that is used in several passages in the New Testament to talk about Jesus and the disciples eating. It'll say, the word will be meat, or they took meat, or they ate meat, meaning food. And the idea is, is that they were reclining at table. And again, that's something that had no meaning in 1611 because Englishmen didn't lay down to eat. They sat up at a large table to eat and 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 in the um, picture of the last supper that um, when that leonardo da vinci painted and uh, he has them sitting at a long table and the disciples on either side kind of like at a on a dais or something before a big uh, audience and and that's not the way this was at all it was just a low table around which there were cushions or couches or or the scripture calls them beds. Sometimes Ezekiel 23, 41 is a passage that describes this perfectly. And so here's Jesus at the head of the table, perhaps Lazarus on one side and Simon on the other. And then down either side of this long table are the remaining guests reclining on one arm up against the table on, on these couches, these pillows. And this is how they were eating. It was a common way in which to eat in those days. And then 
the, the women were serving from behind. This also explains how Mary was able to come up behind Jesus and anoint his feet. She didn't have to get down underneath the kitchen table to do it, but she rather came up behind him and was able to anoint his feet because he was reclining at table. And so the other disciples are there, and they are engaging in this meal. So Mary comes. And as we've said, this is the sister of Lazarus and Martha. And she's not to be confused with this woman over here in Luke 7 who also washed the Lord's feet. And someone says, well, how do you explain that? Two different women doing the same thing. This is another example of where some folks try to find discrepancy or confusion in the, in the text and say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. And, and said, that was Simon's house in Luke 7. This is Simon's house over here in John chapter 12. But that Simon over there was a Pharisee, and this Simon over here was a disciple of Christ. And so here's these contradictions in the story. No, two different stories, two different Simons, two different occasions, because John, as well as the other authors, Matthew and Mark, are very clear that this story that we're talking about tonight occurred at the time of the Passover. Well, then how do you explain this, preacher? Well, it seems to me that the easiest matter is to recognize, first of all, it's two different women who do the same thing. Well, why would they do that? Well, it's the custom of the day. Notice there in Luke 7, though I don't think, as I've said, this is not, not the same narrative, but Jesus talks about the custom. And so that's why I want to turn over there to Luke chapter 7. And said that, uh, verse 30 now, now, 39, now the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, that is this woman, anointing his feet and drying them with her hair, kissing his feet. When the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And then Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. He said, Say on, Master. And there was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed 500 pence, the other 50, and when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Now tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? And Simon said, I suppose he that to whom the Lord forgave most. And he said to him, you've rightly judged. And then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. Jews went everywhere walking. And the sandal of the day was, would not be like our heavy-duty shoes. And so it was the custom to provide, when guests came, an opportunity to wash their feet. This is what we see Jesus doing later in chapter 13 of John, washing the disciples' feet. It was an act of hospitality. And for the host to do it was a demonstration not only of hospitality, but of humility and appreciation for his guests. But he goes on to say, you didn't provide me any water. And this woman, since I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil, thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. All right. The idea of oil, olive oil, was provide olive oil and water were generally provided to guests so they could refresh themselves. And just like our customer, would you like to wash your hands before dinner? And we would take folks to a place where they could wash. And we provide soap and water and towels and, and try to make them feel welcome. And this is what Jesus would have ordinarily expected in a home, but he got none of that. He says, this woman, though, she has certainly gone beyond what is expected. So my head out with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said to her, thy sins are forgiven thee. And so the whole point of reading that, though, is to, to demonstrate what the expectations were of the day. And you go back to that Ezekiel 23, 41 passage, and there is a reference there to oil being provided and ointments being provided. The same thing in Matthew, excuse me, Psalm 23 and verse 5, which is the shepherd psalm. Uh, thou preparest a table before me, uh, and my cup runs over, my head thou didst what? Anoint. And so... The context there is of a, a, a supper, a preparation, a receiving. 
And so this is what would be done for the guest. And we could cite other passages, but I've made the point, and that's all I need to do. These women then were observing the customs of the day. And what better way do you demonstrate to someone that you respect them, that you love them, that you're glad they're in your home, than to provide them with what are the, the basic standards for customary reception to show the general kindness that one ought to do. So both of these women were acting out of love, and that love comes from faith. Now, while we might argue that what either one of them did was still somewhat extreme because they're using this costly ointment and that they're anointing his feet as well as his head because Matthew and Mark indicate that Mary anointed Jesus' head as well. The point is, is that they're demonstrating their love and their respect for Jesus by observing these time-honored customs. Now it says here that she brought a pound of spikenard. Nard, as is it generally referred to today, or spikenard as it was by the Jews, or Indian spike, as it was by the Hindu, is a plant that grows in the Himalayas. Uh, it is collected and dried, and this oil or ointment is extracted from it in order to produce the ointment. There's an essential oil that's taken from the nard plant, and then it's mixed and prepared in a certain way, and it becomes this spike nerd. It refers to the shape of the plant. It's kind of unusual looking thing. I've got a picture of it here in my notes, but it's kind of, it's, it, it has about the size of your finger and it grows up and it's kind of uh, got yellowish, greenish uh, leaves on it down here that kind of are not very long and that tend to dry up. Like on a lot of plants, you know, the leaves start to curl down and dry up and that comes up all on that spike. And then out of the top is where the fresh leaves are and the flowers. And so to take that, they pull it up, and it's got a kind of a root system on the bottom of it, and that's the plant. So it kind of looks like a spike is the idea. And that's how it gets its name. It's a very costly thing. And uh, the Jews, as did many in the East, imported it into their country for its aromatic properties. These are described not only in the text, it says that when she broke the bottle, the whole house was filled with the odor or the scent thereof. But uh, over in Song of Solomon, chapter 1, and verse 12, as well as chapter 4, beginning at verse 11, the aromatic properties of the spikenard are discussed in relationship to the young woman and her love for her uh, lover, her, Israel, her Israeli lover. So it gave a most pleasant scent. And it was expensive, as we've said. So much so that it was said to be 300 pennies, or pence, or 300 denarius. And the denarius was a day's wage. So 300 denarius would have been nearly an entire year's wages for, to purchase this pound of spikenard. Now Mary and her family were apparently affluent because you have... Martha is said to have a house. Mary is said to have a house. Lazarus is said to have a house. And so whether or not they're all married or not, I don't know, but they had their own households, and they were entertaining Jesus and all the disciples, and they often resorted there. So evidently they were somewhat affluent. They could take care of Jesus. But even at that, even at that this is an extravagant gift, or a costly gift at least, and this may have been something that she had purchased herself for her own burial. You know, my grandmother, she lived to be just a few days short of 100. And one thing that she was very adamant about in her last years was that there should be certain things done in preparation for her death. And she made sure she had her funeral planned and paid for and so forth, and that we were to do it the way she wanted it done. And that's not uncommon. That's, it's very common. It's just the way we think. And so here's Mary, and she realizes that Jesus is going to soon be dying. And so a good saying I've always heard, which I think is a pretty good rule to live by, is give me my flowers while I can still smell them. 
And, and if we're going to give a gift to someone and we want them to know how much we appreciate them, when's the best time to do it? While they're still living. And so that's evidently what Mary does here. And she, she takes this gift, which was her own. It was hers to give. She could do with it what she wanted to. We're not certain why she had it, but nevertheless, she had it and she brought it and she gave it to Jesus. And so once again, we see a woman showing genuine love and respect. And it's altogether out of character with the context as well as the character of either of these women to suggest anything here other than a genuine demonstration of love and affection that was certainly holy and righteous and well-deserved on the part of Jesus. And so she anoints his head and his feet. And as is so often the case, somebody has to criticize Something that's good. Doesn't that just aggravate you? When someone just, just does something that, that is just intended to be nothing but kindness and because they want to, to show their love and affection and, and they do it and then someone has to say something about it. There's something wrong with it. And so uh, Judas speaks up and he's, he criticizes what she does there and says, in verse 5, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And then verse 6 is a parenthetical expression supplied by John to let us know this fellow didn't carry anything about the poor, but he was a thief and he had the bag and he bared the money that was put into it. But we see in Mark 9 as well as Matthew 20 that the disciples are quite capable of displaying improper attitudes, aren't they? The whole bunch of them had been walking with Jesus just shortly after he had told them that he was going to Jerusalem to die, and they were arguing amongst themselves about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. And so they could demonstrate some real petty jealousy and some poor judgment. And that's what you have here. You have these men showing just how small they were capable of being. And I think there's a lesson to be learned there as well. That regardless of how we think we are following Jesus, we can do some pretty terrible things as Christians. I mean, this isn't murder, granted. This isn't stealing necessarily, even though Judas was a thief. But thats they're just criticizing her. They're picking at her. Here's a room full of men, primarily, and so the, this woman does something that calls attention, not intentionally, but necessarily calls attention to herself and her affection for Jesus. And the spotlight is off of them and it's on her. And so now someone has to criticize it. Just petty, petty behavior. And, you know, we can do a lot of damage with the tongue. And so... Judas leads the pack here. And John says that he did it because he was a covetous man. He wanted what that was worth. It wasn't because he cared about the poor, but he wanted that money. And you can think, why? Because he had the bag and he was a thief. The man was an embezzler. The man was stealing from the Lord. He was stealing from his friends. And he was stealing from Mary and Martha and Lazarus and all the other women and disciples who had contributed to the well-being and upkeep of Jesus because that's where that money came from. Jesus said, I don't even have a place to lay my head at night. Foxes have holes, the birds there have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. When he sent the disciples out on the limited commission, he says, you go into a community and you find out who's worthy there and you stay with them and you don't go around house to house begging for a place to stay or begging for something to eat or whatever, you go find a place, and if they won't receive you, then you go on. And so Jesus says, you find someone who genuinely wants to display hospitality and who is interested in spiritual things, and so these are the kind of people that had contributed to what was in that bag, and Judas was stealing that. I want that to get into your mind. But that's how sorry a fellow this was. And perhaps, you know, again, we, we just have the information, but perhaps he'd hope, well, if I, we could sell that, you know, or if we had sold that, I might could have covered up some of this money I've been stealing, you know. And he has all kinds of evil motives there. 
And then I want you to think about this. That a few days later, Matthew 26, 15, a few days later, Judas is going to betray Jesus for a tenth of what he thought that was worth. Oh, I could have been sold for 300 pence. Oh, that's a year's wages. Oh, that seems like a lot of money, doesn't it? Put that in today's terms. A fellow making $50,000, $60,000, $75,000 a year, and there are people that make a lot more than that, but that's a lot of money to some folks. Today, a year's wages... But he was willing to betray Jesus for a month's wages. And not the month's wages of a high-paid fellow. He was willing to do it for the month's wages of a day laborer. The $10 an hour guy. So 40 hours a week, four weeks, at $10 an hour. What is that? $1,500, $1,600 in today's wages for a $10 an hour job? That's what... Judas was willing to let Jesus go to the cross for her. Just a handful of silver. And so sometimes people ask me, well, why do you think Judas did it? I think he did it for the money. It's just that simple. Well, how could anybody betray the Lord for money? Well, he did. That's what John says. There might have been some other issues. He might have been embarrassed by the fact that Jesus called him down and ultimately, we could say it's because he didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ. But the simple, most straightforward, plain answer is he did it for the money. And this is why Paul says that the love of money is the root of all evil. I'm always reminded there in Acts chapter 1 and verse 25 that when Peter's talking about Judas, he said he by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. I like the literal southern translation on that. He went to his own spot. The idea there, a place, well, this is a place, and there's room in it for a lot of people in there. But that's my spot right there. You get my point? There's only room for me right there. And that's what Paul, uh, Peter's saying in Acts chapter 1. He says that Judas went to his spot. Except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. See, Judas died, and I believe the Bible teaches he was lost and went to hell because he betrayed the Lord for the money. Now granted, later he regretted it, someone says, Yes, he regretted it. He tried to give it back to the Jews, and they wouldn't take it, and he threw it down in the, in the temple, and they went, and Peter even refers to that in Acts chapter 1, that he, Judas, referring to what he did through the agency of the Jewish leaders, purchased a field with his own uh, money, with that money he used to betray Christ, and then he went out and hanged himself there. They bought the field where he had hanged himself, the potter's field. And they had let him hang there till he rotted off the tree, which was against the custom of the Jews to allow a carcass to be exposed like that. But he hung there till he rotted off the tree and fell down, and if you'll pardon the language, it's pretty plain there, till his bowels gushed out. That's what that fellow got, and he deserved it. And that's what Peter's saying. All because he loved a little money. I want you to think about that and how that can affect your eternal destiny. Well, then Jesus speaks up and he says, let her alone. So Jesus is not going to let these men bully Mary. And have you ever given any thought to the fact that how Jesus elevates women? You know, these these modern wags today, they talk about what Christianity is anti-women, it's anti-this, it's anti-that. We don't, we're intolerant, we hate uh, genderism and all this stuff. You know, we, we're intolerant, that's the word, that's what I'm looking for. We're intolerant. And we try to put women down, we try to put uh, people who are engaging in sin down because they want to say it's their, their choice or their right or whatever. And, and that's not it at all. And when you look at Christianity like you ought to look at it, Jesus elevates women. He didn't let these men bully her. He said, you leave her alone. 
she has anointed me against the day of my burial. And then Matthew and Mark says she had done what she could. She did all that she could. That's, a, that's high praise, to have done what you could. He says, you leave her alone. And, and so Jesus elevates women. He elevated women by including them in his ministry, going back again to that reference I made earlier about the women who contributed to the care of Jesus. These women are mentioned there in Luke chapter 8 and verse 1, uh, verse 1 and following. Have you ever thought about who it was that washed Jesus' clothes? Did you ever think about who it was that cooked his meals? These, these are the women that took, took care of, of Jesus. And there were other women in these communities where they would go and stay. And these women, they served, but Jesus made it clear. He says, look, your place is not just a place of manual labor. This is the whole point of Luke chapter 10. He says, Martha, you're worried about a lot of things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen the good part. And so while women might be limited in their roles in some respect, they're not preachers, they're not elders, they're not deacons in the church. So I said, yeah, they're just, they're just the servants, they're just the slaves. No, Jesus said they're disciples. And the fact that they're disciples is more important than anything else. That's the good part. And Paul went on to make it clear when he talked about there is no respect of persons, and he takes that principle that he introduces in the book of Romans to say there's no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. He brings it over to the book of Galatians in chapter 3 and says there's neither male nor female. The fact that we have different roles in the kingdom does not diminish our importance to God because of our gender or because of our education or because of our socioeconomic status. Those things don't matter. And so Jesus elevated women. And he understood that their spiritual needs were just as important as any man's spiritual needs. Going back again to, to Luke 7, that woman who came upon whom Simon looked down so much on because she evidently was a woman of the street, calls her a sinner. If he knew what manner of woman she was, and there's no reason to doubt that he's not characterizing her past life correctly, but she had heard about Jesus and she'd heard about grace and she'd heard about the forgiveness of sins and she came to Jesus as a penitent sinner. Much like the woman in John 8 who was taken in the act of adultery to whom Jesus says, go and sin no more. These women who were abused and oftentimes misused and ill-treated and forced into circumstances which were degrading Jesus recognized that through the forgiveness of sins, through his death, he could elevate them. And so wherever Christianity has gone, the condition of women has improved. I'm amazed at some of the things I hear. Where do you think the idea of gender equality comes from? That's a biblical precept, folks. A biblical precept. There is no difference. They're entitled to the same rights as everyone else it is entitled to. Well, so Jesus says, let her alone against the day of my burying has she done this. And here again is the great teaching moment. Against the day of my burying necessarily implied in that is what? I am going to die. And when you think about it, it's within a week that this is going to happen. Jesus is going to be arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it seems to me that Mary understood this before the twelve did. Because they're complaining about it and they're, they're not seeing it for what it is. And Jesus sees it for what it is, an act of love, a demonstration of faith. The fact that she realizes he is about to die and they don't get it. So Jesus reproves them for it. Seems to me Mary's been listening. Martha had been listening. Mary, she chose the good part, it says, and then she had a moment of doubt and weakness when her brother died. But Martha, she pulled through on that, and she came to Jesus and she says, I know that my brother will, 
be raised in the last day. She'd been listening. She understood. She said, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who should come into the world. That's weeks before Peter makes a good confession. So Jesus... is pointing out what she did on the basis of her faith. And I believe it would be altogether out of the character with the Lord, of the Lord to assign a motive which didn't exist. Would it have been right for Jesus to say, she has done this against the day of my burying and she didn't have a clue? Or she had some other motive? No. Jesus rightly represents her motive. So I know she understood. Jesus goes on to say, for the poor... Always you have with you, and I think we miss that. Deuteronomy 15, 11 states that as a truth, and I'm not saying that we don't always have the poor. We do. That's a perennial problem. But Jesus is not talking about the poor here. Jesus is talking about opportunity. What was the point of contrast? Jesus had said, well, we ought to have taken this and sold it and given the money to the poor instead of giving it to Jesus as if there was something wrong where they're having anointed the feet of Jesus. Do you realize that when he criticized Mary, he criticized Jesus as well? And I've always thought, so, well, that seems kind of silly to me. Well, if, if we should have taken the money and given it to the poor, what we really should have done was canceled the supper and just gone out and fed the poor. When they're criticizing Mary and they're criticizing Jesus, what they're doing is criticizing themselves. Isn't that the way it is? Isn't that just the essence of hypocrisy anyway? Is to apply a standard to others that you're unwilling to apply to yourself? It's really kind of comical what's going on here if it weren't so pathetic. A room full of men overcome with petty jealousy for a woman who is doing something based upon a genuine faith that Jesus is about to die for her sins, and the best they can come up with is, well, we should have taken this and given it to the poor. Hypocrite. So Jesus is not talking about the poor. Jesus is talking about opportunity. You have the poor with you always. Me, you do not have. Always. And this is why Jesus says, as according to Matthew Mark, she has done what she could. She seized the opportunity. And so she used it to demonstrate her faith. Now, after all that's over, John kind of gives us a view of what's going around on the outside. He says there were a lot of people that knew that Jesus was there, and they came. Now, they weren't all sitting at the supper. When I first began to preach, I preached a little place called Humphrey, Arkansas. I may have mentioned this to you before. I'm sure I have. And, and that little church has been there well over 100 years now. Same frame building that's always been in, made out of cypress wood. It'll, it'll be there till. Jesus comes or a really good fire. And years ago, before I was certainly down there preaching, they'd have meetings down there. Of course, all the windows would be up, you know. And in those days, back in the 20s and the 30s, all you had to do was announce that there was going to be a meeting, and everybody showed up. And the building would be full, and the windows would be up, and there'd be the hangers on, and they would literally be hanging on outside the window kind of leaning in, looking to see what was going on. You know, Everybody came. They didn't want to get inside because they didn't want to get too involved, but they'd, they'd sit, hang on the windows or they'd sit out uh, around and listen to what was going on. Used to have a big tent meeting or something and they'd get a microphone and, and, and there'd be people who'd be under the tent and there'd be people out in the cars and then there'd be people on their porches and so on and so forth. And the microphone wasn't for those under the tent. It was for everybody else. And so that's what you have here. You have these, these folks who are coming, perhaps out of curiosity. Some of them may be there because they're the enemies of Jesus. But the thing about it is that there were a lot of them who were there when they came and they heard Jesus and they saw Lazarus. What happened? They went away believing. 
They wanted, they wanted to know about Lazarus. And, the, and when they saw him in good health, sitting there talking to Jesus, and Simon the leper as well, and knowing what Jesus had the power to do, these people believed. And so it says in the next verse there that the Jews wanted to put him to death, that is, Lazarus, because he wasn't helping their cause any either. <laughs> And are we surprised? Jesus has says if they want to do it to the teacher, what are they going to do to the disciple? Don't be surprised. Well, I want to ask you. What Jesus says here that's of prime importance is opportunity. You don't always have the opportunity to do what Mary did. And we'll never be able to give Jesus a cup of cold water. We'll never be able to wash his feet. We'll never be able to anoint his head with oil. We'll never be able to do anything personally for Jesus in this life. But are we running out of opportunities to see Jesus? Are we going to miss the opportunity to obey Jesus? Are we going to miss the opportunity to be convinced that he is the Christ? We're going to go away one more time unconvinced, unconverted, uncommitted, and then eventually what's going to happen? One of two things. We're going to die, or Jesus is going to come back, and we're unprepared. Now, they, the text says that when they saw <coughs> Lazarus, many of them believed. Well, what about you? That's what this whole series on John has been about, is trying to convince you and convict you, if you're not a Christian, that you need to believe on Jesus. What else do you have to see to be convinced? The next great miracle that we're going to encounter in the life and ministry of Jesus is going to be the resurrection from the dead, his resurrection. And if that won't convince you, nothing will. But there have been so many things that we've seen up until now. And so this is the time and the place for you to obey Christ while Jimmy leads us in the song.